Hello, this is the third class in our online section of the course. It's the class for March 31st. Uh, we knew from the beginning of the course that we divide our historical time into three sections, ancient, middle, and modern. And this is the first class uh, where we take a step away from the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. Uh, it's very important because a lot of these definitions and concepts I'm going to talk about uh, here directly uh, will obtain uh, through the rest of the course, through the rest of the, the month that we have of the course. So you'll see me looking down more often uh, because I, I want to make sure I get things exactly right and not throw things off, off the cuff. Uh, if there's anything at any point you don't understand, make an instant note of it uh, and then send me an email about it and, and we'll, get it, we'll get it right. Uh, the title of uh, this, this uh, class is based on two handouts stapled together. Uh, the first is called Italy, Birthplace of the Renaissance. And it's three or four pages long. And then you come to the second part. Uh, which is called the uh, Northern uh, Renaissance. So those are the two handouts stapled together that we're going to be working, going to be working with. Uh, the title of the first part, uh, Italy, Birthplace of the Renaissance. Uh, let's, let's get some basic terms defined right off the bat. Uh, Renaissance is a Latin or French word that means rebirth. Uh, when you say the Renaissance, you're referring to a movement which began in the 1300s, uh, to achieve a rebirth. A rebirth of what? A rebirth of nothing but civilization itself. Uh, had civilization died? Well, according to the movement known as the Renaissance, it had nearly died when the barbarians overran Rome uh, and it was at death's doorstep uh, once again here in the 13 and 1400s. Uh, when the barbarians overran Rome, uh, the church was there uh, to save civilization. Uh, we, we, we've seen that in the different ways in which the church went about that. The problem with civilization now in the eyes of this uh, movement called the Renaissance is that civilization is once again at death's doorstep. And the reason for that is that the church is no longer a positive influence on civilization. It has become a negative influence on civilization. Now, I want to make one thing clear again at the very beginning. When I talk about the church and a decline in the status of the church or the importance of the church or anything negative about the church, I'm talking about the church as an institution. Now, I'm not talking about the Christian belief at all. Those, those are two separate things. Uh, one is the message, and there's no decline in uh, the belief in the message. Uh, the other is the messenger, and there's a great deal of falling off of trust and admiration for the messenger as we go ahead in the, uh, go ahead in the Renaissance. So it's, it's civilization that's going to be reborn in the eyes of this, of this movement. Uh, how is civilization going to be reborn? How is this thing going to be uh, achieved? Uh, and the answer is in the first handout, first part of the handout, the answer is by bringing back the spirit of Greece and Rome. And how that will be done, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Uh, the second handout, talking about the Northern Renaissance, uh, there the idea is that civilization is going to be uh, reborn by bringing back the spirit, not of Greece and Rome, but the spirit of the early church, the spirit of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the savior of civilization. The church has now gone bad, and rebirth is, uh, rebirth is necessary for that, uh, for that reason. Uh, how rebirth is going to be, uh, well, let me, let me look at the other term in, in the title, uh, Italy. Uh, we're familiar with Italy. It's the boot-shaped peninsula that extends from the mainland of Europe into the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we've talked a lot about Rome. Uh, Rome is at kneecap height on that uh, uh, leg-looking uh, peninsula. Uh, the Renaissance took, Italy was not a country. 
uh, any more than ancient Greece was a country. Italy is, like ancient Greece, a grab bag of independent cities, each of which is a minor little country unto itself, going its own, going its own way. Uh, these city-states were the ideal place for a renaissance to take place because the cultural legacy of Greece and Rome is stronger in Italy than anywhere else. And these city-states uh, are very rich. They're very wealthy indeed. And this movement requires a lot of money uh, to patronize, to subsidize, to promote uh, the arts and literature and the different expressions of this rebirth that's going to, that's going to take place. So Italy was, the, was the, the best place for a renaissance of this kind to begin. It was also the only place a renaissance of this kind uh, could begin. So we have an effort here in the renaissance to uh, southern renaissance or the Italian renaissance to bring back, to bring civilization back from death's doorstep by bringing back, giving rebirth to the spirit of Greece uh, and Rome. So that's, that's where we're set. That's where we're set now. Uh, the most obvious sign of the uh, comeback of ancient Greece and ancient Rome uh, is called humanism. Humanism is two things. This is the mode of operations of the Renaissance, humanism. The Renaissance is powered by humanism. Humanism drives it. Humanism propels it. What is humanism? Humanism is two things. First is very simple. The second is pretty involved. The first definition of humanism is that it is the collection and the cataloging and the storing and the preserving and the putting into libraries of the ancient manuscripts from Greece and Rome that have survived. Uh, where have those manuscripts been? Uh, they have been, for the most part, in scattered across Europe in the hundreds and hundreds of monasteries uh, that were a feature of the, of the church's effort to save civilization in the early days. Uh, these monasteries, I remember talking about it in class, they had reading rooms and writing rooms, and these, these selfless men uh, who lived lives of silence and prayer and chastity and poverty and obedience, the whole routine that we talked about, also found time for hard work in the fields and hard work in these reading and writing rooms. And what these men did, meant most of whom could neither read nor write, uh, was to copy and preserve forever uh, the handwritten documents. A, man, a manuscript is a handwritten document preserve forever the handwritten documents or manuscripts from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. It's been estimated that 80% of the manuscripts we have from Greece and Rome, we have only because of the copying that went on in these monasteries. And what the, the Renaissance as a movement wants to do is to collect all of these things, bring all of these things into the libraries and museums of the cities uh, that are the uh, hotbed of this, uh, of this uh, movement that we call uh, the Renaissance. The second thing that humanism is, the first is the collection of manuscripts and the cataloging and so forth. The second thing that humanism is, it, it, it is the label that we use for the modern ways of looking at things that began here in the Italian Renaissance. This is our first step into modern times. And the modern way of thinking, of the modern way of living and acting, that was all based on ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Uh, and the manuscripts copied and cataloged are going to bring all of that back to life and in that way bring about the rebirth of civilization. It's an ambitious undertaking, but the Renaissance was full of self-confidence. It had no doubt about the correctness of what it was doing and the, the, the possibility of achieving the rebirth of civilization. Tremendous self-confidence. The most obvious way to see it is in the art of the uh, Renaissance. And our handout is real good on uh, Renaissance art. Uh, there's a picture by Raphael 
uh, of the of the birth the marriage of the virgin uh, your folder a thousand words folder is better than the handout however on renaissance art because you have raphael's school of athens uh, and you have perugino uh, the great painting of peter receiving the keys to the kingdom of heaven from christ those those are great humanist works of art what makes a humanist work of art a humanist work of art briefly it is the entry it's a revolution in art and it's briefly bringing into art a sense of perspective or simpler language a portrayal of background and context to make a picture two-dimensional uh, and if you, you look at the paintings in your folder, you, you, you'll see this. It, it makes paintings two-dimensional, but by bringing out the background, that which is in the foreground uh, is, is, is seen, in a different, seen in a different way. And that different way is a revolutionary change in, in the way we think about and look at art uh, as an uh, important component of uh, civilization. Uh, it, it's here in the Renaissance for the first time. And it wasn't just in art uh, that humanism made its influence uh, felt. Uh, there, humanism made its influence felt in the practice of law for the same reason. Uh, the importance of background, the importance of context to any case before the law, whether you're prosecuting or whether you're defending, background is so important to what's in the foreground. And the same is true of, in medicine. Uh, medical history is an important part of every patient's uh, folder, every patient's dossier. You, you can't imagine practice medicine without knowing something about the medical history of the, uh, of the uh, patient. Uh, life itself shows the influence of humanism in this, in this movement. Life has a more relaxed tone and feel to it. It has a more liberated tone and feel to it. It has a more creative tone and feel to it uh, that had been absent, again, in the opinion of this movement. All of that had been absent since the decline of Greece and Rome, and now it needed to be brought back again because civilization is at the is at death's doorstep uh, once, once again. The church was not there to save civilization this time. Uh, the church is actually part of the, part of the problem uh, that civilization has. Its, its influence has become negative uh, rather, than, uh, rather than positive. Uh, another brand of humanism, uh, if you will, is called civic humanism. And th this, is, this, is, this is a really interesting and important kind of humanism because civic humanism uh, replaces in society's eyes at the pinnacle of human achievement life lived on the highest plane a man can live in other words in the middle ages that that figure that character to be admired as such uh, was was the crusading knight or the humble monk. Uh, but now in the Renaissance, the ideal figure, the man who lives life as it can be lived at its fullest is the good citizen, as in the case of the good Greek citizen or the good Roman citizen. The good citizen is historically minded. He participates in the life of the city. Uh, he serves the city. He, he is a citizen entitled to the rights and has obligations to uh, contribute to the city, and being involved in that way is uh, is is to be a is, is to be a good is to be a good citizen. Uh, another component of of humanism, just as new as uh, perspective and art, uh, was the invention almost of what we call analysis. Uh, analysis was pretty much foreign to the Middle Ages, to the age of faith. Uh, analysis 
is when you speak of analysis, you're talking about looking at things from different angles, sizing a thing up, looking at things from different angles, different points of view. In the Middle Ages, there was only one angle. In the Middle Ages, there was only one point of view. But now, in, as times become modern, things are being seen in, in different lights and from different perspectives. Uh, there are different ways of describing things, different ways of understanding uh, things. Uh, analysis. Uh, analysis is also the way in which when you're faced with a complex problem, a big problem, a complex problem, or a problem difficult to understand, what the modern mind does to that is to analyze it. And that means to break it down into its component parts and see how it fits together. That, that's the way the modern mind works. And it began working that way here. It began in our course really on the first day of the course. And I'll explain what I mean. I, we, we have before us a tremendous expanse of time, a tremendous length of historical time, thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. It can't be understood unless it's broken down into its component parts. And so we broke our historical time. We analyzed our historical time. We broke it down into ancient, middle, and modern. And as we get more deep, deeper into the subject, we subdivide those periods of time uh, as well. So we, we've left the ancient, we've left the middle or medieval, uh, and we're now at the beginning stages of our third uh, period of time, uh, the early modern uh, phase of our uh, history. Uh, another brand uh, of humanism that's, that's very important these things are all interrelated, of course. They're all very, I'm, I'm starting to sound like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, and I am, and I, I mean to. And what I, what I want to point out here is that there is political humanism as well, political analysis uh, as well. And the primary example of that in your handout, uh, in the first handout, is on page 422. Uh, you, you've got a picture on 422 of Niccolo Machiavelli. Uh, the author of The Prince, uh, a humanist book published in 1513. Uh, Machiavelli analyzed political power, how to get it, how to use it to your advantage, how to keep it, how to avoid the mistakes that will cause you to lose it, and to approach politics in that kind of analytical way, find your way through the maze of politics by the power of analysis. Power, politics is power. How do you get it? How do you keep it? How do you use it in a way that maintains you in power? Uh, the, the conclusion that Machiavelli uh, came to uh, in, the, in the Prince was that at all costs, the man interested in political power, getting it, keeping it, has got to disassociate himself, divorce himself from any and all considerations of higher morality. Uh, that, to political power, is, is the kiss of death, and moral scruples have to be tossed right out the window. Uh, in order for power to be gained and kept uh, and used uh, in, in, in a permanent and successful, permanent and successful way. So humanism comes in a lot of brands, in uh, lots of different types of humanism in the Renaissance uh, in, in Italy. Uh, and taken together, they amount to a modern way of looking at things, whether you're looking at the law or looking at history or looking at medicine or looking at painting or looking at political power. There's a modern way of looking at those things, and it begins here in the Italian, in the Italian Renaissance. The, if we can go to the second uh, part of the handout uh, titled uh, The Northern uh, Renaissance, We've got a different kind of humanism here, uh, a completely different kind uh, of humanism. Uh, the mind process is the same. 
Civilization is in need of rebirth. How to achieve it? You achieve it by the application of humanism. What is humanism? The collection of manuscripts and learning new ways of doing and thinking about things from the ancients. All of that is true in the Northern Renaissance, mainland, I mean, heartland of Europe. All of that is true in the Northern Renaissance as well, except, and this is so important, except in the Northern Renaissance, we're not looking back to Greece and to Rome for inspiration. It's not to reclaim, regain, revive, give rebirth to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. That is 40% of who we are, but the Northern Renaissance wants to look back to the early church, to the church of the Old Testament and the church of the New Testament, that church. That was when the message was pure. That was when the message was heartfelt and spiritual. And that is the key to preserving Christianity. Christianity and civilization to the Northern Renaissance are the same thing. And Christianity, thanks to the church in this day and age, the day and age that we talked about last time in the turbulent century, uh, the church is not the same church as it had been in the early days. The message is the same, but the messenger has declined. The messenger has, has, gone, has gone bad. Uh, what, what were the problems with the church as an institution as far as the Northern Renaissance was concerned? The things that stood in the way of Christianity in its purest, original, most spiritual form. Well, you could see the symptoms. The church had been helpless against the plague. The church had been helpless against the Hundred Years' War, couldn't stop either. The church had been helpless against the King of France, couldn't stop a pope from being beaten to death, couldn't stop the papacy from being taken away from Rome, couldn't stop the election of two popes and then three. And how did the church answer John Huss? who criticized the church on all of these things, the church burned him at the stake. So the messenger has changed. The message is unimpaired, unchanged. It needs, to be, it needs a new messenger. It needs to be brought back to the, to the status and to the frame of mind that it once had. The present church has got too much money. The present church has got too much land. The present church has too much political power for what's supposed to be a spiritual institution. Uh, the church has too much of a lot of negative things, but land, political power, and money uh, are at the top of the list. The church, in, an, in other words, in the Northern Renaissance, has become a dead weight. It, it's become an albatross uh, around our neck. And if we don't get rid of this messenger, the Catholic Church, uh, it's going to pull Christianity down with it. Uh, just as in the South, uh, we need to bring back Greece and Rome. Here in the North, we need to bring back uh, the great days of the, Christian, of the Christian church. How do we do that? Same way. You collect the original manuscripts. You collect the oldest writings of, of the Christian faith. Uh, they are found in the monasteries. It's, it's identical right down the line to the kind of humanism we were talking about a minute ago. You, you, you bring back the manuscripts, you get them preserved, cataloged, and you read them. And you let them govern your faith. And you turn your back on the messenger in order to confront the message in the original languages, which are Hebrew for the Old Testament, then Greek for the Old Testament and Greek for the New Testament. You, in other words, you, you, you discard the thousand-year-old Bible of Jerome, which has been the only Bible for a thousand years. That goes out the window. Why? Because it's a translation. And, and we need the words of the church to be in the original language of the, of the writers uh, of, God's, of God's Word. You think of Gregory writing 
with, 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 with a dove on his shoulder, the Holy Spirit. Well, the purity of that message has been lost uh, because the church has lost its way. The message is good, but the messenger has gotten lost uh, in the things of this world. And that needs to be, that needs to be corrected. Uh, the most important of the humanists, Christian human, this, this brand of humanism is called Christian humanism. And the most important man in Christian humanism and the most important document in Christian humanism is Erasmus, the man, and he's discussed briefly on 425. And when you get to his name on 425, you stop reading the page. That, that's all you need from 425 is his name, because what it has to say about Erasmus is not nearly as important as what I'm going to say uh, about Raz Erasmus. Erasmus' great achievement was to translate the New Testament into, or bring back, I should say, the New Testament in its original language, Greek. When he did that, and then the same with the Old Testament, you see, then we've got a clean copy. We've got the closest thing to the original Word of God that we're ever going to have. And now the next step can be taken, and the next step is what John Huss and John Wycliffe wanted to do, and that was to get the Bible into the modern spoken languages of the 14th and 15th century. A Greek New Testament is the original language, that's fine. But who reads Greek? Hardly anybody reads Greek. It's, it's, it's not a spoken language any longer. But if you have the original text of God's Word, or as close as humanly possible to get to it, then you can work from that to get God's Word into English or God's Word into, into German. Erasmus cleared the decks uh, for uh, the Bible in the uh, spoken languages, and that was the great achievement of, 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 Christian, of, of Christian humanism. Uh, Christian humanism criticized the church, it mocked the church, it ridiculed the church, uh, it made the church look cruel and intolerant and narrow-minded and hypocritical, and in some ways the church was indeed all of those things. Uh, and it was the Christian humanists who applied humanism, not to the revival of Greek and Roman civilization, but applied humanism to the revival of Christianity. And that was, that was, its, great, that was its great achievement. And, and that's where we're going to leave off. Uh, that's where we're going to leave off today. But I want to close with a cautionary word uh, about everything I've said about, particularly Christian humanism. Until 1456, all of this writing that I'm taking, that I'm describing, that is taking place, is in hand writing. There is no book mechanically typeset face, typeset book until the invention of the printing press, 1456. If you owned a book before 1456, it was probably a scroll wrapped around a spool. And it was for sure written by hand. When the printing press meets humanism, when books can be mechanically printed with the elimination of errors and mistranslations and so on and so forth, we are set to enter uh, the, modern, the modern world. But here's the cautionary note. We can't think that because the church is under such attack that the Christian message is under attack. Uh, that would be a complete misunderstanding. Christian faith was never deeper but faith in the church was never more shallow than it's become uh, in, in this time. Uh, it's worth noting that the first book, the first book to come off the printing press, the first book to be published mechanically was Jerome's Bible, published by uh, 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 Matthias Gutenberg. 
the Gutenberg Bible. It, it's Jerome's Bible from a thousand years earlier. And that was the first book to come off the printing press. Uh, we didn't have a Greek New Testament yet. And the Christian faith is never in question here. And it, it makes all the sense in the world that the Bible, the first book printed on the printing press, would be, would be the Bible. And the second thing I want to say is that our next topic is going to be, as we enter the modern world, is going to be the voyages of exploration and discovery. And when we get there Thursday, day after tomorrow, we're going to have to remember, but we won't have to remember because we'll see it just plain as day, what drove those explorers out across the oceans of the world. Uh, the motivation was primarily religious. Uh, the motivation was not political freedom. Uh, the motivation, there was economic motivation, of course, but the primary motive behind the voyages of exploration and discovery was to spread the gospel throughout the world. Uh, and that is my way of ending by saying again that the church as an institution, the messenger, its days are numbered. Uh, but the Christian message thanks to the Renaissance, to the Christian part of the Renaissance, to Christian humanism, uh, is, is, is safe and sound and in good hands into uh, the future. Uh, if I've confused you or if I've made a point that you don't understand or if you're simply saying to yourself, I don't know what you're talking about, uh, make a note of it and get me an email and we'll take care of it uh, right away.